Citizens of Heaven understand that prayer is our first resort, never our last response. You may have heard about Daniel's little uh, overnight stay in the lion's den, but do you know that it's prayer that got him in there and prayer that got him through? In the book of Daniel chapter six, we see that he'd worked his way up to pretty much running the entire empire. He was fully trusted by the king and still wholly devoted to God. And as often happens in Babylon, other leaders become jealous and start trying to find a way to trap him. They end up getting the king to sign into law that if someone prays to anyone else other than his majesty for 30 days, they'll be thrown into the lion's den. And look at Daniel's response in verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he'd always done, giving thanks to his God. Look at this. Knelt down as usual. Prayed three times a day, just as he'd always done. Daniel was a man of prayer, living in constant conversation with God. And when opposition came, he turned to what he'd always done, praying just as usual. You and I can and should be men and women of prayer like that. Just like Daniel, bowing in prayer in our everyday relationship with God so that when opposition comes, we've already been trained in the first response of our faith. But in order for us to live like that, we have to understand what prayer is and why it makes us powerful as we live as exiles. I've heard it said that prayer is communication with God. And that's true. We can talk to God anywhere about anything at any time, but... Prayer is not just that. Communication merely scratching the surface of what we get with God when we pray. St. Augustine defines prayer as communion of the mind with God. David McIntyre in one of my favorite books says, No duty is more earnestly impressed upon us in Scripture than the duty of continual communion with Him. I love this link between prayer and communion. Both of these men showing us that prayer is more than asking for things or uh, sitting down to thank God before a meal and it even goes beyond confession and repentance. For communion literally means intimate fellowship or harmonious relationship. Prayer goes beyond our thoughts about God or our request to God and extends into the very core of who we are. Prayer is communion with God. It's a becoming one with Him. It happens by means of giving of our every thought, every emotion, and every desire over to Him to the point where we can say like King David in Psalm 109 verse 4, I am prayer. It's as if David is saying, my life is so open before God and so in communion with Him that I am a constant prayer. And this is available to all of us, Christian, our lives becoming more and more open to God through prayer, so much so that every thought is directed at Him and by Him. And this is the life Jesus modeled for us. Those who watched Him most closely knew it best. They had to have seen Him often going off by Himself before dawn to be alone with God. And as Luke chapter 5 tells us, because of this, His, his disciples saw praying as the natural outworking of an intimate, loving relationship between father and son. Speaking of Luke's, I'm actually going to quote my friend Luke here and his thoughts on this very subject. He says, Successful prayer is not measured by how long we can sit quietly and be focused, nor is it measured by the eloquence of our speech or thoughts. Successful prayer is only measured, if at all, by our returning to the father despite the many distractions and responsibilities calling for our attention. This is the life Jesus modeled. This is the kind of prayer his disciples asked to learn. This is the kind of prayer life we can all have. So, to just kind of get us started, whether we are the most saintly of prayers or the most fresh of beginners, here are a few things Scripture guides us in to pray like Christ. All right? So, first and foremost, as already discussed, start with some space and make it a routine. Put the phone down. Get alone, play some quiet music or don't, 
But it is vital that in order to learn to pray, we often withdraw just like Jesus. And just to encourage you, use what you currently have. You don't have to begin with an hour. Simply give God some designated space specifically meant for Him and see how He grows this time together. Secondly, use the Bible for help. There is a literal guide for prayer from Jesus in Luke chapter 11 where He says, pray like this. The book of Psalms, a book full of prayers. Some of my favorites to literally pray are Psalm 139, 84, 25, and 145. There are prayers of lament and grief, a whole book entitled Lamentations. There are prayers of perseverance modeled by Jesus in Matthew 26, Luke 22, John 17. Citizens of heaven read the word. Citizens of heaven pray the word. Thirdly, tell God everything. Literally, hold nothing back. Talk to God about doing the dishes. Process your job with Him. Celebrate what you're excited about. Tell Him you're angry at Him. Tell Him what you're scared of or worried about. Tell Him, one thing I do, I tell Him good morning out loud, first thing when I wake up, and good night last thing before I go to bed. If prayer is communion, then God wants every single part of us. He wants to share every thought and emotion. He wants the cutting grass thoughts and the depth of prophetic intercession. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. The message version puts it this way, He is most careful with you. And you could say, sure, He knows it all anyway. But this is not about knowing information. It's about sharing life. And He wants all of it. Fourthly, ask big and ask often. Over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus says to ask for anything in His name and He will answer it. Most of us, our problems with prayer don't boil down to asking too much. It boils down to asking too small. If a request is selfish, the Spirit will work it, he'll work it out through prayer. But constantly coming all polite and making sure we're asking just the right way or for just the right thing, it hinders communion and actually doesn't allow the Spirit to confront our requests. This is your time with God. Ask for whatever you want. Hound heaven with your voice. He told us to. This is not our idea. We're taking Him up on His command. And the beautiful thing is, the more we ask and the bigger we ask, the more we're coming face to face with Him through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. And the more we do that, the more Psalm 37 verse 4 can happen in our lives. You're probably familiar with this verse. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Maybe you've heard this as a misguided promise before. The whole do good for God and He will give you what you want theology, but that ain't it. What God is promising here is that as we come to Him in prayer again and again and again, our very core starts to shift. We see Him for who He truly is and it changes us. As we become prayer, like David said, we become like God. And as we delight ourselves in Him, His desires become our desires. He takes the core of His heart and places it inside of us. This is the beautiful result of prayer that the best thing it gets us is God. Citizens of heaven, give yourselves to prayer. Make space for it. Use the Bible, tell God everything, ask big and ask often, and then, like Daniel, we will become the kind of people who are able to face anything, even a lion's den, and still say, I can't help myself. I am prayer.